One day when I was a junior in high school, the bell had just rung and I was on my way to art class. It was on the furthest end of the school, so I was walking pretty quickly to get there in time. All of a sudden, an announcement came on the intercom. It was the secretary from the front desk of the school. Her voice was shaky as she announced that the school had just been placed on lockdown and everyone needed to get inside the room closest to them and follow lockdown procedures. Before hanging up, she said that this was not a drill. There was silence for a moment before total chaos erupted in the hallways. Everyone was running around and there were papers and books being scattered about. I was nearly to the art room at this point, so I ended up just sprinting there. When I got there, the room was bustling with people running in all different directions. After letting a few more people into the room, the teacher decided to close the door and lock it. We turned off the lights and then all gathered in the back of the classroom where we wouldn't be visible from the window in the door. It was almost completely silent in the room despite there being at least 30 people in there. I was doing my best not to expect the worst. Maybe this was just a false alarm. The teacher got a notification on her phone and we watched as her eyes grew wide as she read it. In a hushed voice, she informed us that there had been a murder in a neighborhood down the road from the school, and the police had reason to think the suspect was hiding somewhere nearby, possibly in the school. I couldn't believe what was happening. This seemed like something from a horror movie. One of the younger girls in the class was so scared that she was crying and shaking, and a few other kids were trying to comfort her. Because I was sitting closest to the supply closet, the teacher asked me to go in the closet and grab a blanket. The supply closet was a very spacious walk-in closet with rows of shelves on either side. I scanned the shelves looking for a blanket when all of a sudden I noticed something strange. In the back corner of the closet were long pieces of fabric hanging up that were used for sewing projects. Behind the fabric, I saw a pair of dirty shoes. Someone was hiding back there. I wondered why they weren't with the rest of the class when all of a sudden it hit me. Was that the murder suspect? My heart was beating like crazy. I knew the best thing I could do was pretend I didn't know the person was there. Trying to appear as calm as possible, I grabbed the blanket before turning off the lights in the closet and shutting the door. I handed the blanket to the girl before going up to the teacher and whispering to her what I had seen. I knew if the other students found out what I had seen, there would be a panic and that would not end well. I could see the fear in the teacher's eyes, but she said nothing, just picked up her phone and sent a message to the front desk. 10 minutes of silence went by before the teacher got another notification. She then stood up and told us that she had been told that we needed to walk calmly out of the classroom and go to the middle school across the street until the school was cleared. We did as we were told. Part of me was sure that the suspect was going to chase after us, but the closet door remained shut. Once we were out of the school, we began running at a full-on sprint until we reached the middle school. We stayed there for hours until our parents were eventually able to come pick us up. On the news that night, we found out that the SWAT team came to the school and was able to capture the suspect without anyone getting hurt. A shiver goes down my spine anytime I go into the closet, even now. One day I was walking to math class and one of my friends stopped me to ask if I was ready for the test we had that day. I told her I was confused because I thought the test wasn't until next week. She insisted that it was today and she said she had been up all night studying for it. My heart sank. The test was a huge part of my grade and I wasn't prepared for it at all. I was so panicked that I told my friend to tell the teacher I was sick and I was going to hide in the bathroom. She told me she would. I quickly ducked into the nearest bathroom and went into the last stall, preparing to spend the next hour on my phone. I was hanging my backpack up on the hook on the stall door when all of a sudden an announcement came through on the intercom. It was the school principal. He said that the school was now under lockdown and that this was an emergency. Everyone was to get to the nearest classroom and follow lockdown procedures. At first, I assumed this was a drill until all the lights went out, leaving me in pitch darkness. This had never happened in any of our drills before. Was there actually a real emergency? I frantically texted my friend from math class and asked her if she knew what was going on. She texted me back right away and said that a male student had been seen threatening another male student over a knife. It was supposedly an argument over a girl, but the rumor was that the guy was completely deranged and there was no telling who he might hurt. I had little to no protection, so I was terrified. I climbed up on the toilet seat so no one would be able to see my feet, and I tried to stay as quiet as possible. Several minutes went by before I heard footsteps enter the bathroom. It was someone crying, but I couldn't figure out if it was a boy or a girl. They entered the stall next to me and closed the door. I heard something metal fall on the floor, and I looked down to see the point of a long silver knife. 
I don't know what went through my mind at that moment, but my sheer panic caused me to make a run for it. I unlocked the stall door and started sprinting through the hallways. I kept running until I got out of the school, my arms in the air as I came face to face with an army of police officers. After they patted me down, I explained exactly where the suspect was. Luckily, they were able to catch the guy without anyone getting hurt. It turned out that the guy didn't end up stabbing anyone, he just threatened him. He did, of course, still get into plenty of legal trouble, and he hasn't been back at school since. When I was a sophomore in high school, I was sitting next to my best friend Kayla in geometry. The teacher had finished the rest of the lesson and was giving us the rest of class time to get a head start on homework. Kayla was trying to explain to me a problem I didn't understand when all of a sudden we were interrupted by the intercom. There was an announcement that we were under an active lockdown and everyone needed to shelter in place immediately. We asked the teacher if she had been warned that we were going to have a drill and she told us no. The teachers are always warned about lockdown drills, so this was when we realized this could actually be a serious thing. The teacher locked the door and turned off the lights. Then we began working together to push our heavy metal desks up against the door so that no one could get in. We then hid in a corner of the room. I was tucked underneath the teacher's desk along with a few other students. We were all quiet, checking our phones to see if we could figure out what was going on. I was looking through the news app when I saw that there was a crazy man believed to be on drugs that was involved in an assault right by our school. It was believed that he may have entered our school and was still on the loose. I shared this information with the class and we were all even more terrified. A few girls started to cry and some people were texting their parents to let them know what was going on. I had a sister who was a freshman who was also in the building and I texted her to see if she was okay and ask if she knew what was going on. 15 painful minutes went by before she texted me back. She said someone had been banging on her classroom door and screaming profanities for the last 10 minutes, but they had finally gone away. I decided to keep this information to myself, not wanting to freak my classmates out even more. But before long, I heard yelling in the distance and held my breath, hoping that whoever it was would just pass by the classroom. But before long, there was a sudden banging at the door, followed by a crazed laughter. The man began taunting us, telling us that he had a gun, and there was no point in hiding because he was going to get us. We were horrified but did our best to stay quiet. Our teacher was on the phone with 911, giving them a whispered update of what was happening. Suddenly, there was a loud gunshot from the hallway, causing several of us to cry out loudly. The man outside laughed even harder. There were shouts from further down the hallway and I understood to be police officers. They demanded the man drop his weapon. After several requests, they tased him and I heard him screaming like crazy. Around 30 more minutes went by before we were finally told that the school had been cleared, the man had been taken into custody, and we were free to go. This story is about a terrifying experience that my best friend had in high school. To protect her privacy, I'll call her Hannah. It was the spring of our freshman year and prom was approaching. At our school, only juniors and seniors went to prom. Sometimes a lucky sophomore would get asked by an older student and get to go, but that was pretty rare. Of course, all the younger girls couldn't wait for it to be their turn to go and loved watching all the cute ways the juniors and seniors would ask their dates to prom. We all chatted about what kind of dress we would wear and who we would want to go with. Hannah was hands down one of the prettiest girls in our grade. Her long red hair and sparkling blue eyes always caused heads to turn when we would walk through the hallways. She was humble about it and didn't let her looks go to her head. Unfortunately though, her looks sometimes led to unwanted attention from guys she wasn't interested in. She had politely turned down a couple of guys already that year. She believed that dating in high school was silly and she just wanted to focus on her schoolwork and friends. One day after school, Hannah and I were hanging out in the courtyard. We weren't old enough to drive yet, so we had to wait for our mothers to pick us up. We were giggling and chatting about class when we were approached by a senior guy that we'll call Alex. Neither one of us had ever met Alex in person, but we knew he had a reputation for being kind of creepy and sort of an outcast. I thought it was strange he was approaching us since he had no reason to talk to us. Alex zeroed in on Hannah and asked her for her phone number. She was shocked and she was silent for a few moments before eventually giving it to him. He took it and went on his way. I asked her why she had given him her number and she said she felt bad because it seemed as if he didn't have many friends. 
As it turned out, what Alex wanted was a lot more than a friend. Beginning that night, Alex began incessantly texting Hannah. He kept telling her how beautiful she was and how much he wanted her to be his. Hannah had no romantic interest in Alex whatsoever, but was too nice to tell him so. She didn't answer his texts. In time, he would call her on the phone or even just post on her Facebook page. The next day, Alex was waiting outside of her classroom after the first period, and then the next, and it was getting seriously creepy. Luckily, Hannah and I had a lot of our classes together so I could walk with her, but Alex trailed behind us. His eyes glued to Hannah. It was like he was obsessed with her. This continued for a week until I finally convinced her to do something about it. Hannah blocked Alex's number and blocked him on every social media platform. She then told him she wasn't interested in him and he needed to leave her alone. It was like nothing she said to him made a difference. He continued with his stalking ways and would get in touch with her by using burner phones with different numbers. Everything took a turn for the worse after the last period next Friday. Hannah and I had just gotten out of art class and we were making our way through the halls where the freshman lockers were located. We we were deep in discussion about an exam we had that day and almost didn't notice that a crowd had gathered near where Hannah's locker was. As we got closer, we could hear giggling and whispers. The crowd cleared and there, standing in front of Hannah's locker, was Alex. He was holding balloons and a sign that read, will you go to prom with me? Hannah stood there, frozen for a few moments before running away in embarrassment with tears running down her cheek. People snickered as she ran. I chased after her to console her. After calming her down, I told her that it was time that we did something about this. It was clear that Alex wasn't going to stop on his own and we needed to tell someone about him. She agreed with me and we decided the best thing to do would go tell a counselor first thing on Monday morning. I would go with her for moral support. Hannah and I spent most of the weekend together. We swam and rode bikes and did lots of activities that didn't require her to be anywhere near her phone. Alex was still blowing up her phone, calling from blocked numbers, and it was seriously stressing her out. His messages were getting creepier and he was becoming even more possessive. He would tell her that she was his and there was nothing she could do about it. He was a crazy person who had become obsessed with a girl he barely knew. Given the fact that Alex was of legal age and Hannah wasn't made the whole thing even creepier. There was no telling what he was going to do. And that was why it was so important we talked to a counselor and maybe even get a restraining order. Monday morning rolled around and Hannah and I agreed we would go to school early that day so we would have time to talk to the counselor before first period. When I got to school, I could tell I was one of the only people there and there were barely any cars in the parking lot yet. Hannah had texted me to tell me she was going to stop by the art room. She wanted to check on the progress of a clay pot that our teacher had put in the kiln the week before. I texted her to tell her I would meet her there and we could walk together to the counselor's office. I made my way through the quiet, empty hallways to the art room, which was near the back of the school. I opened the door and stepped inside, but I didn't see Hannah. On the ground, I saw red droplets that looked like spilled paint. Strangely, they appeared to be wet, which didn't make sense because no one would have been in the classroom over the weekend. I walked over to the closet where the kiln was located and nearly slipped over Hannah, who was laying on the ground, absolutely covered with blood. I was so stunned that I don't think I even screamed. I took in her condition and noticed what appeared to be two stab wounds, one in her abdomen and the other in her arm. Her eyes were barely open, but she was breathing. I shook myself out of my stupor and ran out of the classroom, assuring Hannah that she was going to be okay and that I was going to get help. I began screaming help as I sprinted through the hallways, but they were empty. Finally, I reached the office just as the school nurse was walking in the door. As quickly as possible, I explained to her and the receptionist that my friend had been stabbed and needed help right away. The receptionist called 911 as I led the nurse to where Hannah was laying. By this point, some kids had begun arriving and things were getting chaotic. No one knew who had hurt Hannah or where they were. My mind went right to Alex. Who else would have done such a thing? As the nurse began checking Hannah's vitals and trying to stop the bleeding, I heard the principal come over on the intercom. He explained that the school was on lockdown and everyone needed to go into a classroom, lock the door, and hide. The school nurse told me to run and lock the door to the art room, instructing me not to open it for anyone but paramedics or the police. Every second that ticked by was painful because I knew it was another second that was going by without Hannah getting the medical treatment she needed. The nurse could do her best, but Hannah needed to go to the hospital and she needed to go quickly. Finally, I heard banging at the door. A male's voice called out, identifying himself as a paramedic. But what if it was a trap? I told them we needed proof and they showed their badge under the door. 
After examining it, I unlocked the door and allowed a team of paramedics and police officers in. The police swept the room while the paramedics began loading Hannah onto a stretcher. I ran up to one of the officers and told them I thought I knew who had hurt Hannah. I gave them Alex's name and description. Now that they knew what to look for, their search would be easier. I doubted Alex could have gotten very far. The paramedics carried Hannah out to an ambulance that was waiting outside and the police instructed me and the nurse to remain in the room until they could be sure the building was clear. As soon as they left, I locked the door and the nurse helped me put stools and tables over to barricade the door. Then we sat and waited for what felt like hours. It hit me that I might lose my very best friend, and the feeling was too much to bear. The only thing I cared about was that she would pull through, and they would find Alex, so this whole thing would finally be over. I was incredibly relieved to finally hear the principal's voice on the intercom. He explained that the suspect was in custody and that we were free to leave our classrooms. I exited the building and headed straight to the hospital where I was eventually allowed to see Hannah. She had to have multiple blood transfusions, but was remarkably able to pull through and was allowed to return home after only a couple of days. As for Alex, they finally found him hiding out in the men's locker room. He will never be able to get anywhere near Hannah or my high school again. I'm so grateful. I think Hannah and I both learned a valuable lesson from this experience. Always trust your gut and ask for help before things get worse. What would you have done in this situation? Should they have told someone? Drop a comment and don't forget to like and subscribe. When I was in middle school, my parents let me walk home from school because we lived really close by. They would of course give me a ride if it was raining or freezing out, but for the majority of the year, I would follow the same short path home each day without incident. One fall day, I was walking out of school and passing the rows of buses waiting to pick up kids. Then I passed the carpool line with parents waiting for the kids to come out to the car. Most kids either walked to school or rode the bus, so the carpool line was always pretty short. In fact, I knew which cars belonged to which families and would always wave to the parents as I walked by. It was a small town, and everyone tended to know everyone else. That day, I remember seeing a car I didn't recognize in the carpool line. It was black with windows that were so tinted I couldn't tell who was driving. I couldn't even tell if it was a man or a woman. I shrugged it off, assuming maybe it was just a family member from out of town that was picking someone up. I continued walking and eventually made it off school property and onto the paved path that led to my neighborhood. There weren't many cars around that day and things were pretty quiet. I looked ahead and noticed that there was a black car parked a short distance ahead of me, right along the path. It looked a lot like the car I had seen in the carpool line, but I couldn't be sure. I remember thinking it was weird because it would be blocking traffic if a car came down the street. For some reason, I felt a little bit uncomfortable and even considered crossing to the other side of the street. But the path I was on was the most efficient and I wanted to get home as fast as possible. When I approached the car, I looked straight ahead and pretended not to notice it, quickening my pace. But just as I was passing the vehicle, I could hear the window roll down and a man's voice call out to me. I turned to look and it was an older man who I didn't recognize. He had a black hat on and a black trench coat. Something about him made me feel even more uneasy. He told me that his name was Phil and that something had happened to my dad. He said that my mom had asked him to go pick me up from school and take me to the hospital and that's why he was waiting in the carpool line. I immediately knew that something was off. If anything had happened to my dad, I knew my mom would never send someone I had never met to pick me up. I had plenty of other family members that they would call first. I told the man that I thought he had the wrong person and began to walk away, but he persisted, telling me that he was sure I was the girl he was looking for. At this point, I was really creeped out, so I just began to walk away, heading towards my house at a quick pace. I heard a door open behind me and looked back to see that the man was running after me. I began sprinting as fast as I could towards my house, but the man was catching up quickly and I needed to throw him off. There was a wooded area leading up to my house and I decided to run through it in hopes that the trees would hide me. When I reached my house, I looked around but saw no sight of the man. I went inside, locking the doors behind me. I told my parents about him and they filed a police report, but it has been years now and they never found him. When I got my driver's license and my first car, I would always get gas at a gas station just across the street from my neighborhood. One day after school, I got in my car and noticed that I was nearly empty and I would have to make a stop for gas on my way home. I drove to the same gas station that I always used and pulled up to the pump. I then took the key out of the ignition and got out of the car. As the machine prompted me to do, I inserted my card and typed in my PIN number as usual. A few seconds went by before a message popped up on the screen that said my card had been denied. 
I was annoyed because I knew that my card definitely had money on it and was completely valid. I started the whole process over once more, and yet again I got a message saying that my card has been denied. I was definitely irritated. Now I was going to have to lock my car and go into the gas station to pay with cash. I knew I'd be waiting in a long line and it would take even longer for me to get home, but I knew I'd run out of gas if I didn't go in. I walked into the gas station after seeing how many people were in line, decided to walk around the store a bit in hopes of it later quieting down. I strolled through the aisles and ended up picking up some bottled lemonade. I was in the snack aisle trying to decide whether I wanted a bag of candy or some chips when I heard a low whistle. I turned to see it was from an older man standing close by me. He wore tattered clothing and a cowboy hat. The man looked me up and down before complimenting me on my dress and my appearance. I was taken aback by the compliment I hadn't been looking for and felt uncomfortable about the way the man's eyes were staring at my body. I was only a teenager at the time and suddenly felt as if the dress I had on was no longer covering as much skin as it should be. I simply turned away from the man without saying anything back to him and tried to focus on what I wanted to buy. The man didn't seem to get the hint. When I began to walk away, he followed me, this time asking what my name was and how old I was. I didn't answer and did my best to act like I didn't hear him. He was standing very close to me and when he reached out a hand to tuck a free strand of my hair behind my ears, I felt absolutely livid. I told him I wasn't interested in continuing and conversation with him and that I wanted to be left alone. He laughed at my reaction, but eventually walked away. I was relieved and thought that I had finally gotten rid of the creeper. I grabbed my last item and walked up to the register to pay. After checking out, I walked out the automatic doors to head back to my car and pump the gas I had prepaid for. But shockingly, there was a white van blocking my path to the car. All four doors were open, and the man with the cowboy hat was standing right outside. I sprinted past him to my car and locked the doors just before he was able to catch up with me. I ended up driving straight home and reached the driveway just as I ran out of gas. My parents and I called the police and they caught up with the man later that night. It turns out that he was wanted for a possible connection to a kidnapping in a nearby county. I grew up in a safe community where crime rarely occurred. My parents didn't worry much about anything bad happening to me in our area, so as long as I stayed in the neighborhood, I could ride my bike alone as much as I wanted. Their only request was that I got home before the streetlights went out. I always did as I was told, and there was never a problem. That was until one scary night in October. One of my friend's families was throwing a bonfire party in honor of Halloween, which was only a few days away. Anyone who wanted to come was invited, and it was expected to be a super fun event. The actual bonfire wasn't going to start until it was dark out, so I told my parents, and they told me it was fine if I came home that night. They knew my friend's parents really well and trusted that I would be completely safe. The party turned out to be so much fun. The adults were enjoying drinks while us younger folks were roasting marshmallows and making s'mores. We were all having such a good time that I was surprised to look down at my watch and notice that it was nearing midnight. I knew my parents would be waiting for me, so I decided it was time for me to be heading home. I said goodbye to everyone before hopping on my bike and speeding off towards home. I had only been on the bike for a few minutes when I heard a strange noise and my bike come to a sudden halt. I checked out my tire and realized it was completely flat. I was trying to decide what to do when all of a sudden I heard a voice that felt as if it came from nowhere. I looked up and saw an older man standing right next to me, a creepy grin on his face. He held a tire inflator in one hand and offered to help me out. I absolutely cherished my bike and felt terrible about leaving it behind, but there was something off about the man that made me not want to accept his help. Just as I was trying to decide what to do, the man reached out with his free hand and grabbed me, holding me tight from behind the neck. I frantically began kicking and screaming, just barely freeing myself from his grasp. I then took off running towards home on foot. I glanced back, but the man wasn't following me. After getting home, I told my parents what had happened and they called 911. Unfortunately, they are still searching for the man. I never felt comfortable riding my bike alone in the neighborhood again after that. Can you imagine ever being in these terrible situations? What would you do? Drop a comment, like, and subscribe, and stay safe. When I was in high school, there was this girl who I'll call Anna for privacy reasons. She was definitely on the shy side and didn't have too many friends. She was a bit of a nerd and got picked on sometimes by other students. She was nice enough, so I always tried to make an effort to smile at her in the hallway and talk to her in class from time to time. I think she appreciated this and before long we kind of became friends and would help each other out on assignments for the classes we had together. 
Eventually, Anna's birthday rolled around and she asked me if I would want to come over to her house for a sleepover to celebrate. I felt a little weird about it because we had never hung out outside of school before and weren't exactly close friends. So a sleepover seemed a little premature, but I hated the thought of her spending her birthday without any friends, so I ended up agreeing. The day of the sleepover, I went to the store to find Anna a present. We wore uniforms at school, so I didn't really know what her style was in regards to fashion. I walked through the jewelry aisle and noticed some blue dangly earrings that I thought were cute. I figured they would go well with Anna's blue eyes, so I decided to get them. After purchasing the earrings, I plugged in Anna's address into my GPS and headed over to her house. Everything started normal. Anna's parents were really nice and seemed very relieved that she had a friend to celebrate her birthday with. After dinner and some small talk with her parents, Anna and I decided to head down to the basement where we would be sleeping that night. I handed her the present I got her and she excitedly opened it up. When she saw the earrings, she was absolutely thrilled and was way more excited than I thought she would be. It made me wonder if this was the first time anyone other than a family member had gotten her a gift. She was so excited that she reached over to hug me, startling me a little. When Anna leaned back, I looked at her ears and realized that they were not pierced. I felt bad that I had given her a gift she couldn't even use and told her that I still had the receipt somewhere and she could return the earrings and get something she could actually use. But she shook her head and told me that the earrings were perfect and she was going to keep them. I thought this was a little strange, but shrugged it off, figuring that maybe she was planning to go to the mall to get her ears pierced soon. We ended up watching a movie and then calling it a night at around midnight. I got into my sleeping bag and she got into hers and I drifted off pretty quickly. Sometime later in the night, I was awoken by Anna gently shaking me. After a few moments of confusion, I sat up to see what Anna was trying to show me. I was shocked when I looked at her as she stared at me, a giant smile on her face. She had taken the earrings I had gotten her and pushed them into her own ears until it broke the skin and came out on the other side, essentially piercing her own ears. There was blood running down her face on either side and some on her sleeping bag. The metal ends of the earrings were pretty blunt, so to get them to pierce through her ears must have taken lots of time and pain. I had no idea why she had done this, but I was incredibly disturbed. I ended up faking being sick and driving myself home early. I still see Anna at school, and she is always wearing the earrings. During my sophomore year of high school, there was this girl in my algebra class who I'll call Morgan who sat behind me. Morgan wasn't exactly someone you would think of as being popular. In fact, she was really anything but. She had pretty bad acne and talked with a little bit of a lisp, so she got made fun of a lot. Sometimes the guys in our class would imitate her lisp right in front of her and the teachers would rarely do anything about it. I was absolutely terrible at algebra and would struggle to keep up in class. Lots of times the teacher would call on me and I wouldn't even have a decent guess of what the answer was. But Morgan would subtly lean over my shoulder and whisper the answer to me under her breath. I was so appreciative of this because it saved me from a lot of embarrassment. One day Morgan and I swapped numbers and we began texting outside of school from time to time. Most of the time it would be about schoolwork, but occasionally we would talk about other things as well. I was really into following the fashion trends at the time, which Morgan noticed. Sometimes she would ask me about what I thought of the latest fashion trends or different outfits celebrities were wearing, and I would give my opinion. One Friday, Morgan came up to me after class and asked if I would want to spend the night. I didn't really want to go, but I felt like I couldn't say no. After all, she'd been so nice to me all semester by helping me out with math. I told myself it was only one night and it would be fine, so I agreed. She seemed very excited and gave me the address to her house. That night, I drove to her house and was surprised when my GPS led me to a huge mansion that looked like something you would see in the movies. I walked up to the door to knock, but Morgan must have seen me coming because she opened the door right away and led me inside. The house was just as breathtaking inside, complete with stunning art and expensive looking furniture. Morgan led me upstairs to her bedroom and I was shocked when she opened the door and I saw my own face. There was a selfie of Morgan and I that had been blown up and was hung right above her bed. I didn't even remember taking the photo. She must have snapped it really quick when I wasn't paying attention. But that wasn't even the most disturbing part. She led me into her closet and inside was nearly every outfit that I had worn over the last few months, even the exact same shoes. She explained to me that she wanted to become just like me and had been taking notes of what I wore, how I talked, and even how I laughed. She talked to me about this as if it was a completely normal thing to do. She almost acted as if this was supposed to be a compliment to me. 
But it didn't stop there. She bent down and pulled out her sock, revealing something that made my heart drop to my stomach. It was a tattoo of an anchor, identical to the one I had recently gotten on my own ankle. The tattoo is for my older brother, who is actively serving in the Navy. It was something very meaningful to me, and I couldn't believe Morgan had gone out and got one that was identical just to be more like me. I felt completely violated and disturbed, and I ended up running out of the house to my car. I drove home and blocked Morgan's number on my phone. I still see her at school from time to time, but I do my best to avoid her at all costs. Back in high school, there was this girl I knew who I'll call Farah. Farah wasn't exactly well-liked. She was the kind of kid who would remind the teacher that there was supposed to be a test that day if they forgot about it. She was also the kid to turn you into administration if you ever got caught cheating. I wasn't what you would call friends with Farah, even if maybe she thought differently at the time. But we both played the flute in the school band, so we would end up having to spend a lot of time together at school at different sporting events. One day, Farah asked me and a few other girls from the band to come over to her house for a sleepover. Not one bit of me wanted to go, but one of the other girls she had invited convinced me to come because she had already agreed and didn't want to be the only one there. I told Farah I would come, and just as I expected, only me and my other friend showed up that night to the house. Farah didn't seem to know how to act when we got to her house. Her room was impossibly neat, and there were no games or anything to keep us entertained. It was clear that the boring, straight-laced individual she was at school was really how she was all the time. We turned on the TV and came across a popular sitcom on one of the channels. My friend and I suggested to Farah that we watch it, but she shook her head and said her parents didn't let her watch shows like that. We asked what she was allowed to watch, and she said she could only watch the Children's Network. We were in our mid-teens at this point, so this was clearly strange, but I said nothing. I was relieved when it was finally time to go to bed. I couldn't wait for this nightmare to be over. I crawled into my sleeping bag next to my friend, and Farah went to her own bed. I was exhausted and fell asleep pretty quickly. At some point during the night, I got a weird, uneasy feeling that made me wake up. I opened my eyes and was shocked to see Farah on her knees staring at my sleeping friend. Her back was towards me and I watched as she stroked her hair and ran her fingers down her collarbone. It gave me a sick feeling inside. I asked her what she was doing and she told me my friend was having a nightmare and she was trying to calm her down. I ended up waking up my friend and telling her what happened. We were both so creeped out, we ended up leaving early. To this day, I wonder what would have happened if I hadn't woken up that night. Back when I used to teach kindergarten, I had one of the scariest experiences of my life. I worked in a small town at an old school that had been around for over a hundred years. It was the same school I had gone to when I was in elementary school, just as my parents had before me. The school hadn't been updated much throughout the years, and some may find it to be on the creepy side. But personally, I loved the classic, timeless feel the building had. One afternoon, I led my class outside for recess. The time passed quickly, and before long, I blew my whistle to signal that it was time for everyone to line up and go back inside. After getting back inside the classroom, I got my students set up with the craft they were about to be doing that day. While passing out supplies, I noticed that one of my students, Lily, Lily was crying. Lily was one of the best behaved students in my class. She was always kind and got along with everyone, never causing me any problems. I bent down to her level and quietly asked her what was wrong. Wiping away tears, she told me that a little girl named Emma had bullied her on the playground. She said the girl had pulled her hair and thrown rocks at her. I was confused. We had no one named Emma in our class, and there were no other classes out on the playground that day. I thought perhaps that Lily had the name wrong of one of the other students and asked her to point out Emma, but she only shook her head and told me the girl wasn't in our class. I asked some other kindergarten teachers if they had any students named Emma, but no one did. It was a real mystery. Things took a turn for the worse the next day at recess. I watched attentively, keeping careful track of Lily. She was having fun playing with her friends. That was until she went down the tube slide. While she was still inside the slide, I heard a blood-curdling scream, and I raced to her to see what would happen. When Lily emerged from the slide, my heart dropped. On her arm was a bloody bite mark that she told me Emma gave her. I picked up Lily and ran inside, asking another teacher to watch over my other students. I took her to the nurse and then walked straight into the principal's office, where I was informed of the situation. When I told the principal the name of the girl Lily said was hurting her, I could see something in his expression shift. 
He informed me that many years ago, there had been a student named Emma that went to the school. She was tragically killed by another student who pushed her from the top tower on the playground. The tower had since been removed, but now the slide stood in its place. Curiously enough, the little girl that had pushed her was named Lily. We ended up having a priest come and bless not only the playground, but the whole school. I've never experienced anything else weird after that, but thinking of this story still sends a chill down my spine all these years later. During my first year of teaching, my husband and I only had one car that we had to share between us. My husband would drop me off at school on his way to the office, and then he would pick me up when he got off work. The school day ended at 3.15, but he didn't get off work until 5 p.m., so I would hang out in my classroom for at least a couple of hours until he could get me. One day, my husband texted to tell me there was an unexpected client at work and his boss was making him stay late. I was a bit annoyed. I didn't have any snacks on me, and I was starving. By this time, it was nearing 5.30 p.m. and all the other teachers and staff members had already left. I texted the school's custodian to tell him not to worry about locking my classroom door. I would be sure to do it before I left. By the time 7 p.m. rolled around and the custodian had left and I was the only person left in the building, my stomach was grumbling so I fished some loose change out of my purse and headed down the hall to get something from the vending machines. The building was dark except for the safety lights, which were left on all night long. I was standing facing the vending machine when I heard a noise a short distance behind me. It sounded like something dropping to the floor. I spun around but saw nothing. I chalked it up as nothing. Some of the kids had lockers that were stuffed full. A magnet or something could have just fallen inside of one. I made my selection, and after retrieving my snack, I headed back towards my classroom. When I rounded the hallway, I jumped as I heard what sounded like someone pounding on the metal lockers, followed by a creepy little laugh. Was someone pranking me? It seemed cruel and unprofessional to prank the newest teacher. But how could there be anyone else in the building if the doors were locked? My anxiety growing, I full on sprinted back to my classroom and shut the door behind me, my fingers shaking as I tried to work the lock. I grabbed my phone and texted my husband to tell him that someone was messing with me and to ask how long he'd be. When I set my phone back down, I was alarmed to hear more banging at the door, followed by terrifying laughter. At this point, I was sure I was in danger, so I called 911. Police were there within minutes and they did a whole search of the building, only to find no one. They later reviewed surveillance footage and saw a hooded man following me through the hallway, but they never managed to catch him. The school had to get a security guard after the incident. When I was younger, I taught English at a local high school. I loved my job and got along well with all of my coworkers. I thought I was well-liked, which is why I was especially shocked when I went to my car at the end of one school day and noticed that it had been keyed. I didn't know of anyone who would have been mad enough to do this to me, so I was pretty upset. I convinced myself that whoever had done it might have thought my car belonged to somebody else. I tried to forget about it and didn't even report the incident. But sadly, the digs kept coming. I opened my school mailbox one day and noticed a plain, unlabeled bag. I took it back to my classroom and cut it open with a pair of scissors. To my horror, hundreds of tiny spiders began crawling out. I screamed my head off, alerting nearby teachers who went to get the principal. After I had calmed down a little, I sat down with the administration to discuss the incident. The principal asked if I thought there was any student that might be trying to get revenge on me after getting a bad grade or an assignment or something. I told them that there was no one I could think of who would do such a thing. I also told them about the car keying incident, now thinking it might be connected. I assured the principal that I would let him know if anything else strange happened. Only days later, I walked into class to see a white envelope with my name on it had been placed on my desk. Hesitantly, I opened it and was shocked to find a Polaroid photograph of myself. I had been sitting at my desk during my break time eating my lunch. The photo had been taken right outside the one window I had in my classroom. Along with the photo was a message from an unknown center who said they were always watching me. This time, I didn't hesitate to tell the administration, who notified the police. There was a security camera outside of my classroom door and police decided to review the footage to see if they could find anything suspicious. Because the note had shown up at the beginning of the day, they could assume that whoever was the last person in the classroom before I arrived that morning would have left the note. I sat alongside them as they played back the footage. I saw myself leave the classroom after locking the door the afternoon before. Some time passed and then I saw a man in a button-down shirt and slacks approach the classroom door. He looked around suspiciously before using a key to enter my classroom. He left nearly a minute later before hastily walking away. I squinted at the figure to get a better look and gasped out loud. 
The man was the school's Algebra 1 teacher. He had asked me out months ago, but I declined because I was seeing someone else. I couldn't believe he would go to such lengths to get revenge. The police confronted him, and he admitted to it almost right away. He was promptly fired from his job, and I was granted a restraining order against him. Luckily, I've never seen him again since. What would you have done if you had opened that envelope full of spiders? Leave a comment, and don't forget to like and subscribe. Until next time, sleep tight.